Okay, hello and uh, welcome back to this uh, lecture 20 on bio microelectromechanical systems. We'll just do a quick review of what happened in the last uh, lecture. So, we discussed about capillary electrophoresis, which is essentially the fractionation of uh, DNA molecules through thin capillaries loaded with gel materials, okay, agarose, hydro hydroxyalkyl cellulose, polyacrylamide, so on and so forth. So, the advantage here is that uh, essentially the, the, the detection throughput of uh, these micro capillaries is much much more than the conventional gels. Uh, one of the reason being that um, because of the high surface area to volume ratio, uh, the temperature of uh, these gels, uh, the amount of heat that these gels can absorb without getting broken or molten uh, is really very high and therefore, you can uh, it can withstand higher amount of electric fields or higher amount of EMF, uh, electromotive force. So, a voltage is as high as about 1000 to 3000 volts uh, can be successfully applied into this microcapillaries in order to move uh, DNA fragments. And therefore, essentially uh, there are twofold advantages. One is the increased mobility because of the higher electric field. Another is you know the ability because this is a micro capillary it is overall lesser in size. You can accommodate a dense network of such capillaries uh, in a very small area um, and can do effectively an array based detection. So, it is a high throughput system which you can generate using capillary electrophoresis. We also talked about space domain PCR reactors and how to design them. I uh, will just like, like to reiterate again that uh, all PCR microchip devices have been categorized into time and space domain devices respectively. The time domain device, uh, there is a small chamber and uh, essentially uh, this chamber is circulated uh, through um, three or four uh, zones of temperature, um, th three or four uh, different points of temperature as is true for a normal PCR process. And uh, there is a general confinement of the volume, uh, the, the reaction volume inside that system. And uh, in the space domain devices, you have to kind of oscillate physically uh, this PCR fluid as a droplet or as a micro droplet over the three different heating zones, okay. And uh, this uh, lets you or helps you to avoid the ramp up, ramp down additional time as the time domain device would require. So, special designs, uh, special domain space uh, PCR reactors have been designed and uh, essentially. Uh, what happens in these uh, cases is you have to design it for the maximum velocity so that you can uh, do uh, the robustness of design. Uh, even though the, the, the fluid is moving at its peak, uh, the PCR fluid has enough interaction time with the temperature zones for it to get denatured, annealed and extended according to whatever process step it is in. And uh, essentially space domain PCR comprises of a channel uh, which is uh, uh, engraved over these three differential heat zones and then uh, given multiple terms. So, we designed uh, uh, such uh, a reactor device. We also talked about a uh, little bit about fabrication processes for fabrication of these capillaries, especially for electrophoresis platforms. Then we did uh, understand DNA mediated self assembly by referring to one of the very first works in this area from Alvisato's uh, group at Penn State. Um, and here it was one of the pioneering works to start this whole field of DNA detection uh, through DNA hybridization. Uh, we also did some basics of genomic detection, how hybridization can be used as an identification for detecting uh, DNA molecules. And then finally, went to uh, this very fascinating, very new area of micro arrays, gene micro arrays. So, we will kind of start from this area today and do some uh, theoretical studies about uh, the different commercially available microarray systems. Uh, as on date, there are about two companies in the world uh, which produce uh, these arrays from two different approaches. One is Affymetrix, another is uh, Nanogen. Uh, their approaches uh, are totally different uh, for making or realizing the capture probes on uh, a surface to create uh, the gene library. Okay. And these cards which are immobilized with this library are either sold um, in one of the approaches directly to the customer and another approach it is basically um, the card uh, platform uh, which is sold and the customer is expected to 
mobilize himself the particular capture probe in the particular area that he intends to do. So, let us look at uh, what hybridization really is and how microarrays function. So, you have these capture probes as you can see here in, in this particular slide of multiple DNA molecules okay? and these capture probes are immobilized onto the surface at the bottom. So, more so like this library. So, you have uh, S1 all the way to S9, S1 through S9 different capture probe sequences and uh, somehow if you can direct sequence S1 to this square in the first row and first column S2 and the first row second column uh, and so on so forth, you could actually make or build a library of these sequences in this different boxes as you can see here. Okay. The advantage is that when you actually have a target DNA and this right here is a target DNA and are able to label it using a fluorophore molecule and uh, the target DNA has the exact complementary sequence of the capture probe that is there on uh, the surface here. Then this target DNA kind of binds to the capture probe and uh, then when you wash the whole sample the unbounded sample is uh, removed except uh, the target DNA which is bound. Okay. And because of this binding and also uh, because it has already been conjugated with the fluorophore you can see um, in one of such spots or one of such areas there is a growth in fluorescence. So, if there is a growth in fluorescence that means there is a perfect complementary probe which is present in uh, this particular area uh, corresponding to uh, the target sequence and uh, if you already have an information of the library as to what capture probe was there in that particular area you could gauge uh, the, the sequence on the target DNA molecule. So, essentially uh, and this is also the basis of detection of nucleotides okay this hybridization principle and uh, it's uh, basically the hybridization of an unknown fluorescently tagged strand with many known strands and these are DNA strands uh, the reaction will determine the sequence of the unknown or vice versa so the question is how do you really make these particular strands here as you can see with a certain sequence which is exactly complementary to some of the targets that you would be planning to pick up eventually and how do you actually make these molecules in these different boxes or zones as is illustrated by this, uh, uh, this big square. So, uh, there are two approaches really uh, which can be used uh, for doing uh, these kind of studies one is where uh, the strand can be lithographically or uh, placed on the surface that means uh, you can actually uh, put the DNA strand with the light directed approach or light direct synthesis uh, that we are going to look uh, in just about a little bit or alternately you can actually direct the strand to the particular position by using an electronic addressing system as uh, is normally done by this company Nanogen. Uh, defined at a specific location. Okay, so, so that is how really the, the concept of hybridization works uh, in biochips and uh, let us actually look at both these strategies independently. Uh, how do you electronically place uh, the DNA probes as uh, is the approach used uh, by Nanogen. Uh, so, here in this particular uh, instance the company really supplies the platform the, the micro scale platform. Uh, which is actually having this electronic addressing system for directing a particular capture probe of interest to a particular area uh, on its surface. Okay. And uh, the, the vendor or the, or the manufacturer really supplies this platform without any mobilization to the customer and the customer who is a biologist is expected or a bioengineer is expected to kind of put probes in a certain sequence by using uh, this platform and electronically addressing independent pixels as I will show in just about a little bit um, how this addressing can be done. And uh, the customer actually takes care of building his own library according to his own requirement. Okay. So, this is the, the basic difference in the Nanogen and the Affymetric approach that uh, the Nanogen uh, uh, is a company which would provide you the platform and it would provide you the protocol for uh, immobilizing the capture probes and it is essentially your job as a customer to immobilize 
and the capture probes that you are looking at and create your own library. So there is greater flexibility that such a product would offer as opposed to uh, the other approaches where they already build in the library and give it to you uh, at the very outset. Okay. So here if you see the, the Affymetrix, uh, the Nanogen approach really, you have this uh, wafer as you can see here and uh, you also have these metal contacts. Okay. And these are connected through conduits to a basic circuitry and uh, the, the connectivity is in a manner that you could provide a charged surface, uh, sorry, you could provide a charged surface onto the electrode. Okay. So, that is how uh, you have connected the particular electrode. So, let us make this electrode uh, connect to a positive DC voltage source terminal. So, what do you expect will happen? Uh, so, there would be a tendency of these capture probes uh, and now, so you place this particular assembly into a solution which has the capture probe for type 1. So, it has type 1 capture probes, the solution above it. And so, when you are actually applying a positive voltage in this electrode, it is very natural to assume that the DNA would move towards the capture probe using electrophoresis okay. and uh, the capture probe slowly kind of comes and settles down on this particular electrode because this is the only one which is uh, charged positively. Okay. So, there is actually a lysine layer here in this area uh, which can do this job of uh, binding uh, electrostatically the negative DNA onto the surface. So, you have uh, a layer which would electrostatically bind the negative DNA once it has approached this particular electrode onto the surface. Now, if you want to uh, put another library or another uh, probe uh, type on say let us say electrode 2, okay, this is electrode 1. So, in that case if you apply a voltage, a positive voltage in electrode 2 here, uh, there would be a tendency of the capture probes and, and remove the voltage on the first one. Okay. You have to remove the voltage essentially on the first one. So, the capture probes now would like to go towards this middle electrode here and the polyalizing film here would again kind of uh, stick to the capture probe and immobilize it. So, there is again a second set of uh, capture probes which are put now in this uh, over second electrode. So, you have one capture probe in the previous step and one in the next step and so therefore, you can repeat this process many times. So, all the different electrodes has a set of capture probes and uh, mind you in this case as we know what the addressing what addressing is being done and if we change solution in between we have a very well idea of what is the sequence on the capture probe that we are putting on a particular electrode. So, essentially we have the information for the whole library of uh, the capture probes which are uh, this way uh, immobilized over the whole uh, silicon wafer with the electrodes. Okay. Now, uh, we can actually pull the target DNA uh, in pretty much similar way, but prior to that we also have to ascertain that they have some kind of an optical transduction mechanism which can make them detectable. So, basically the target that you put inside uh, the solution now, uh, a clean let us say a, a DI water sample maybe. So, the, the target that you put there, the target DNA should essentially be labeled and it should be single stranded uh, structure that you would like to monitor uh, on the sequence. So, now when you can actually uh, put this uh, green fluorophore labeled single stranded DNA molecule as you are seeing here and now apply start applying a potential difference. Okay. So, you are starting to apply a positive potential now in these electrodes. So, there is a tendency of these molecules to kind of come close okay. and uh, these would now uh, based on whichever one has uh, the potential let us say in the first instance only the middle electrode has been given or provided a potential. So, they would all kind of emerge into this middle electrode and try to bind on the DNA which is there on the middle electrode. Effectively what it would mean and this is shown here. So, essentially you have electrophoretic mobility again driving this negatively charged DNA onto the DNA immobilized on the middle electrode. And so mind you these are all fluorophore level and if suppose it is complementary to the capture probe or we are going to test whether it is going to be complementary to a particular type of capture probe or not 
and if suppose it is uh, positive in that sense there would be a binding action and so when you wash uh, this particular chip after the electrophoresis process is over it does not let uh, get rid of these particular uh, fluorophore labels. So, therefore, there is a pixel which is essentially turned on from which one can gauge what is the uh, sequence of the target that you are looking at. Uh, now, you could also use uh, the electrode for a concept of repelling uh, the negatively charged single strand. So, suppose now you have already registered a complementary binding over this particular electrode and this is now futile you cannot use this electrode anymore. So, what you do is in order to prevent any further binding of uh, the negative uh, of the, uh, the other single stranded DNA uh, so that the, you know the, the target concentration is not lost in the next cycle you apply a small negative bias here. So, that nothing comes near this particular electrode once it has been already bound and the, the molecules stay back right. So, this negative bias is used and the other two can then be converted into a positive bias. So, that these uh, molecules can drift essentially towards both the sides okay, and then start binding into this immobilized uh, DNA molecule. So, this is how the nanogen approach uh, is essentially developed for uh, making the capture probe it is a very simple process in a laboratory also uh, the, uh, the experimentalist can actually go ahead and make a library of his own choice uh, and, and then can use that for identification of certain target DNA, DNAs uh, that he is uh, looking into uh, his samples all right. So, the summarily speaking uh, the DNA biochips from nanogen has uh, the following features okay. and uh, this actually has been borrowed from this website here this picture uh, www.nanogen.com. Similarly, uh, this particular example has been borrowed from you know this uh, this referent uh, this cited reference here uh, it is one of my own uh, uh, earlier papers doing review for uh, these kind of systems. And so, essentially in the nanogen approach the chief technology features are the following biochips for DNA detection antigen antibody enzyme substrate cell receptor cell separation techniques all these kind of chips are available. It uh, takes advantages of charges on the DNA or any other biological molecules if you are detecting proteins or antibody antigen etcetera. Every time it uses uh, the advantage that some of these molecules are charged or it has a huge charge at least in its backbone. And then in small sequences of DNA capture probes uh, are electronically placed or addressed to specific sites on the microchip uh, which can be used for grabbing uh, now different one more different target DNAs. So, this is how uh, the chips really would look like once uh, the fluorophore uh, labeled target DNA is immobilized ok. So, here is probably one corresponding to this yellow fluorescence another red fluorescence has come up in the year red fluorescent uh, uh, labeled DNA single stranded DNA binds to the capture probe which is on the surface. Similarly, you have an array of these molecules this is the pink uh, fluorescence this is probably the blue or the green fluorescence. And so, depending on what is the particular captured probe or what is the sequence on the library of the captured probe it captures different targets and we can immobilize or we can actually uh, know where it has been captured by using different fluorescent labels on these multiple targets. So, that you can have rows or columns of uh, you know one colored fluorescence uh, which gives an idea of what. Uh, really uh, you know the uh, the sequence on the target DNA is. Uh, we very well know again the sequence on the capture probe because we are the one as an experimentalist who are actually designing the library and making the library on the top of the chip ok. So, these are some of the main features of uh, the nanogen biochip. Uh, so, essentially what we can say is that in, in a nutshell the hybridization mechanism uh, is essentially is the primary uh, detection mechanism used in these biochips wherein a test sample can be analyzed for the presence of target DNA molecules by determining which of the DNA capture probes on the array bind or hybridize with the complementary DNA in the test sample. So, if there are some rows or columns which are left untouched and there is no fluorescence growth or no pixel turning on that means, uh, those capture probes are certainly not having the complementary sequence of the target. But when uh, the moment there is a residual fluorescence after the wash cycle is over it automatically means that uh, 
uh, you know corresponding to whatever was there in the library part or in the part of the library and if we are able to know that sequence we can really predict what was there in the target as a DNS sequence. So, these are some of the commercially available protocols as you can see this is essentially a, a reader reader card mechanism ok. So, essentially uh, this is the main mother microchip ok and uh, the housing around it surrounding is, is really the reader mechanism and so these are very available very compact manner nowadays in order to uh, you know do hybridization based array detection of DNA. Uh, if you look at the back uh, on the back side for the electrical connectivities of this particular chip you can find out very easily how it looks like. So, essentially these are all the different contacts that you provide in order to provide the electrical voltage to the different array of pillars or posts of uh, principally gold uh, these pillar or posts as you can see here which are carved or manufactured on the top of the chip ok. So, this essentially is the reverse circuitry of this particular chip here which gives you the connections between the various uh, you know, the electrodes on the surface and you can actually keep biasing them positive or negative depending on your uh, requirement ok. So, there is another approach which uh, this company Affymetrix uh, follows. So, in this approach uh, basically a beam of light is used to build uh, capture probes molecule by molecule. And the way you do it is that you take a wafer ok and by the way this actually uh, this technique was reported by Fodor et al back in 1991 uh, which started this company Affymetrix ok. It is a very very innovative uh, approach to build molecules. So, you take a wafer and let us suppose these are different uh, photo molecule capped linker layers ok. So, there are two aspects in this particular layer one is that these blue dots here as you see are photo molecules ok and they are capped over this uh, linker layer which essentially bonds the photo molecule to the substrate. So, in this particular approach the first step uh, is that the some of these capping layers are first removed they are uncapped ok and the way you do it is by exposure to light. So, you have this uh, light source here and uh, you do a light deep protection uh, by using a, a mask. Uh, we have been talking off and on about what a mask is it is essentially a uh, kind of black and white uh, transparency or um, a chrome coated hard substrate made up of glass uh, with certain features and designs uh, which would be transparent. So, wherever there is uh, a transparent uh, via or structure uh, light kind of goes into and decaps or uncaps these photomolecule layers ok. So, you have deprotected this linker layer here by using a light signal. So, you are deprotecting the linker layer in this particular illustration. So, once you do that uh, you actually uh, replace this linker uh, one of the this this top linker layer by CH ok groups and use uh, these particular groups to replace the thymine molecule which has this capping layer at one of its ends. So, you have essentially uncapped these linker layers replace them with CH groups here using a light deprotection technique and masking uh, step and then uh, you in the solution you do have these different adenine, thymine, cytosine and guanine each with these photomolecules or a capping layer. So, you take let us say so you have to grow the thymine in these two sites site 1 and 2 
let us say that is the plan. So, what you do is you actually use the thymine coded or thymine conjugated molecular or, or this uh, thymine conjugated capping layer uh, to this particular molecule such that you replace the CH here by the thymine group okay, and uh, the arrangement actually uh, does a capping back of the opened pixels in this particular step. Okay. So, once uh, this is done again uh, you can use again a different mask with an exposure in two other areas or two other sites to open the linker layer again by decapping these two capping molecules or capped molecules uh, or photomolecules. And then you are again doing the same chemistry wherein you have this uh, uh, OH bonded uh, to this area and then maybe in this case you are applying a cytosine coated with a photomolecule so that it comes and bonds to these two sites here which have been opened up and uh, after bonding it again gets covered with this small capping molecule. Okay. So, essentially you are uh, doing a series of bonding and capping simultaneously and uh, when you keep on opening and closing such uh, uh, capping molecular layers and keep on building the whole library. Uh, this right here illustrates a 25 mer library. Okay, so you have uh, the C, A, T, so on up to G, uh, 25 in number. So it's like a 25 oligomer library that you have built uh, over each of these pixels uh, in a different sense or in a different sequence. So this essentially is again a series of masking and uh, opening of the photomolecular layer and conjugation with a certain group which again brings in a photomolecular layer and then doing the masking process again to open another site. So, you are building a library essentially planning your uh, opening and closing of the photomolecules accordingly. Okay. So, that is what the light directed synthesis uh, approach of Affymetrix is. In this particular case though as uh, in contrary to uh, the nanogen approach the Affymetrix vendor actually supplies with these chips which have been developed in their laboratory and they do have uh, spec sheets which they provide with the uh, particular microchips which talks about uh, the library and the capture probe information uh, in different areas of the particular chip. Okay. So, uh, this is again a, 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 a very very different approach than the nanogen approach. Here the flexibility of uh, using your own capture probe may be limited because um, the vendor would give you this thing this particular capture sequence or a capture probe already synthesized at their end. Um, in a sense uh, what you can do with the synthesis is that you can actually uh, try to build uh, a dense combinations of chemical steps or integrate a dense combinations of chemical steps to build really long capture probe uh, arrays. Okay. So, here as you are seeing in round 1 uh, you are essentially opening and closing the different layers using masking process so that first the A gets uh, sutiued, then the G gets sutiued, then C and T. So, there are 4 steps essentially here. In round 2 you may actually decide to go uh, you know horizontal and uh, then try to make a crisscross arrangement so that you have uh, now uh, you know a combination of uh, let us say an A with an A here, a G with an A here, a C with an A here or a T with an A here. right? So, this is layer 1, this one is layer 2. Okay. In the third step or round 3 you can do a layer 3 from this end okay? and so on so forth. Uh, then in round 4 you could again do the layer from this particular end which is dotted here. So, what I would like to uh, just uh, kind of assert here is that you know the various layers of uh, uh, a certain capture probe could be just uh, drawn by rotating the direction of using uh, or, or you know the direction of uh, placing the mask with respect to the wafer surface. 
and that way you could have a dense integration of all these different molecule layers one over the other. So, table 1 here really talks about and this has been again borrowed from this paper Fodor et al uh, and it is also listed in this uh, Affymetrix website essentially. So, the combinatorial synthesis of uh, polynucleotide probe arrays uh, would essentially mean uh, that so many probe lengths let us say uh, length of 4 would essentially take about 16 chemical steps and the number of possible combinations that are available is 16 uh, times of 16 ok. So, it is uh, 256. So, essentially what it means is that uh, when you are actually having a probe length of 4 all right. So, you are trying to build a sequence let us say A, T, G and C 4 probes. So, for these 4 probes you have to perform 16 steps ok as you can see here. So, the first step can be from this end all right. Let us give me a minute here. So, the first step could be from this end, the second could be from this end, the third could be from this end and fourth could be from this particular end. So, you are essentially rotating uh, the way that you can align the mask with respect to the wafer and you are essentially going through 16 steps in order to get the first layer, the second layer, the third layer and finally, the fourth layer ok of the molecule. So, it can be so, if you want to build like you know an array with 4 uh, different layers uh, all to the surface you need 16 chemical steps for this 4 layer. And the number of combinations that you can have is essentially uh, if, if you assume uh, 16 possibilities ok. Uh, in 16 chemical steps you have about 256 number of possible probes. So, similarly if the probe length is 8 the chemical steps is 32 the number of possible probes is 65536 and so you can see here that the way that this combination of uh, different uh, sequences is increasing uh, is tremendous it can go up to almost 10 to the power 12 with a probe length of only 20 which would involve about essentially 80 chemical steps to get realized ok. And therefore, it is uh, really of vast utility the library can be di uh, 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 very diverse and uh, also it can develop a large number of possibilities uh, just with a few probe lengths on the particular surface. So, light directed synthesis in a way is uh, a very simplistic way of understanding how uh, you could capture different combinations ok all together um, uh, on a single surface different molecules. So, all these uh, gene chips whether it is uh, Affymetrix or Nanogen uh, essentially would look in the product form something like this all right. This is essentially the readout of such a chip. If you can see here there are these uh, fluorescent pixels which have opened and closed at various regions of this particular chip which essentially signifies uh, the binding of the target DNA molecule and therefore, uh, the capture probe which may have been in this region would have corresponded to the target similarly in this particular region would have corresponded to the target and you can get an idea of how uh, what would be the sequence of the capture probe if you could already know what is the existing um, uh, capture probe which is here ok. So, you could get an idea of the target uh, I am sorry uh, the target molecule if um, if you can know or if you can have prior information of what is there uh, as a sequence of the capture probe. Uh, so, that is how uh, a real Affymetrix uh, readout would really look like. So, ultimately fluorescence detection is the basic means of uh, finding out whether binding has happened or not and uh, ultimately uh, this fluorescence detection would be able to limit the size of the pixel in the array because you cannot really go on synthesizing small uh, smaller and smaller uh, just because of the fact that you have to have enough 
fluorescence intensity for the detector to be able to tell you independently whether uh, it is uh, a pixel or it, uh, which has opened up or which signifies the presence of the fluorophore. And so if you go on reducing the size there may be a drastic loss in intensity and the detector may no longer be able to sense. So that is a limitation point uh, for designing the pixel size, the final pixel size although using fabrication you could have probably taken it uh, much lesser in term uh, almost orders of magnitude less than the existing size. So the detection imposes the limit on the uh, final size of uh, the array okay. And uh, these are immensely utilized nowadays these, these uh, different uh, uh, so called uh, gene chips using uh, the various approaches in various laboratory uh, related experiments. Uh, polynucleotide uh, array, HIV resequencing, mRNA expression monitoring some of these protocols uh, are very often in great need of such uh, gene chips to tell you accurately, rapidly, quantifiably uh, how much uh, amount of you know what is what, what can be the sequence on the target or what can be uh, the concentration of the target. So one more in information that you get out of this uh, fluorescence readout is the fluorescence intensity okay. And the fluorescence intensity can signify what is really the binding level in a particular uh, capture probe. And so if the intensity crosses a certain threshold only you take uh, the data in that case and also beyond that uh, threshold whatever change in intensity is recorded uh, is also a change in concentration of the target molecule. So therefore the fluorescence intensity um, uh, provides in addition to the yes no type answer of the sequence uh, an idea of what could be the concentration of uh, the particular target sequence. So that is exactly what. Uh, this gene chips uh, essentially do for gene analysis. So uh, there are other protocols uh, and means for detection of uh, certain sequences of DNA. Uh, this one approach here that we would discuss next is essentially a chip which has been developed by Motorola and this was reported uh, also in this uh, uh, Nature Biotechnology uh, journal back in 2003. And here this is what the chip really looks like if you look at uh, uh, the, the whole platform this is what the gene chip really is and uh, here uh, the detection again uh, is uh, based on a label which is uh, uh, more like an electrochemical label okay. So uh, the capture probes are attached to the electrodes in the first step and uh, this here if you look at is really the capture probe which has been bound this blue stain here is the capture probe which has been bound all the way down to this uh, alkane linker okay. So uh, the substrate preparation in this particular uh, process is very critical. Uh, the substrate is prepared in a manner so that you have molecular wires. So uh, in this, uh, this particular illustration here as you can see there are the surface is not really a plain surface it is uh, pretty complicated. Uh, there is a gold electrode surface which is shown by the blue here okay. So this is essentially the gold electrode surface. There are alkane linkers which are uh, in this particular area um, as an insulator okay. There is a molecular wire which is there inside these alkane linkers. So the molecular wires essentially are the conductors okay. So there is an alkane linker which is an insulator and um, in parallel to it there is a molecular wire which is a conductor. So it conducts it is like a it is like a, a you know a nanoscale conductor which would uh, be able to detect a single electron transfer event. So the way that uh, this works is based on electrochemical sensing and uh, if you can see here the signaling probe okay this essentially is the signaling probe. Sorry, this uh, let us just uh, rub all this off uh, to make this thing a little more clearer. So, this essentially is the signaling probe. Uh, this other end, this complementary end 
of the DNA it has a signaling. Why it is called a signaling probe is because uh, it varies from 3 prime to 5 prime side of the DNA and it contains uh, an electrochemical label uh, called a ferrocene group. Okay? So, what uh, a ferrocene label typically would do is uh, it essentially is an electron transfer agent. It uh, transfers electrons uh, from uh, the ferrocene label when in close proximity to an electrode. Okay. In this particular case, uh, the label if you can see is bonded molecularly to the signaling molecule like this. All right. So, you have a capture probe here bonded to one of these alkane linkers which is an insulator and you have a signaling probe here which has a ferrocene group and which is lying somewhere around in the surface. So, this is the situation. Now, let us suppose we have a target nucleic acid uh, which uh, we want to detect okay. and uh, very intelligently the system can uh, pick this up by aligning the signaling probe flat to the bed of the molecular nanowires and getting the ferrocene very close to the molecular nanowires. Let us see how. So, you have a certain sequence in the capture probe and a certain other sequence in the signaling probe. Now, these sequences can be uh, altered in a manner uh, that uh, a large DNA molecule, let us say a large single stranded DNA molecule uh, can bind to both the capture probe as well as the signaling probe. So, let us suppose this 3 prime to 5 prime molecule here is the target nucleic acid, it is a single stranded DNA molecule and it has groups complementary to a portion on the capture probe okay, and also another portion on the signaling probe. So, essentially it is making uh, the capture probe and the signaling probe kind of uh, one integral by binding halfway through the capture probe and halfway through the signaling probe. But there is another effect which it uh, leads uh, to or generates you know. Uh, when this kind of a binding happens there is almost always the uh, a perpendicular angle between the signaling probe direction and the capture probe direction. Okay. So, when the binding event happens, uh, the binding event kind of ensures that these things are just perpendicular like this. So, this is the capture probe standing upright and this is the signaling probe and they are just perpendicular to each other. So, it gives us some pressure to the ferrocene molecules which are just simply lying on this wire of brushes which has an alkane linker which is essentially an insulator in nature. So, as the pressure is given because of this perpendicular alignment suddenly of the capture and signaling probe, the ferrocene level uh, label kind of gets uh, to a little bit depth crosses the alkyne link linker layer and comes very near these molecular nanowires which are a little shorter than the alkyne linker and therefore, the single electron transfer events are rapidly recorded. So, as uh, they are recorded uh, it gives an idea of whether the DNA has bound both to the capture and uh, signaling probe. Now, this is a little uh, complicated process and uh, uh, essentially uh, there are uh, there are few reasons why uh, this kind of a technique or technology uh, works very well. One is the specificity of detection. So, if you think about a case when there is a DNA molecule which has a sequence which is aligning not only to a capture probe, but also to a signaling probe to consider this electron transfer effect uh, or event to happen. Uh, it is a much better uh, selectivity over uh, just a normal hybridization assay which has only one capture probe uh, binding to uh, the target DNA molecules. Okay? So, that is one aspect of this. Another is that uh, electronic labels especially electrochemical labels uh, have always been the buzzword in the industry uh, because of the fact that it can uh, align them very well with microprocessors. So, that they can do automatic measurements, data analysis, uh, signal acquisition. Uh, so on so forth. So, therefore, microchip architectures almost always have been associated with some kind of a electrochemical or electrical detection. Okay. And uh, so, this uh, thought process of uh, the signaling probe also falls in line with the same idea. So, because of these two reasons uh, uh, this is a very well known uh, architecture which is uh, currently available uh, for DNA detection. Uh, Motorola is a company which actually sells uh, some of these chips for uh, laboratory usage. 
Okay. So essentially, in a summary, uh, there is a target DNA which binds to complementary probes. Okay. Uh, the capture probes are attached to the electrodes. A DNA sequence is called signaling probes with electronic labels attached uh, to them. Okay. So ferrocene modified DNA uh, oligonucleotides E1 by 2 or, or E half the EMF uh, generated in this particular uh, example is about 0 0.120 volts um, and this uh, essentially ferrocene modified DNA essentially acts as a signaling molecule uh, by emitting uh, an electron and binding of the target sequence to both the capture probe and the signaling probe connects the electronic label to the molecular nano wire which is there on the surface and which can do the elect electron conduction and the labels transfer electrons to the electrode surface uh, producing a characteristic uh, signal which would give an indication uh, whether uh, the DNA that you are looking at the target DNA has uh, base pairs complementary to the capture as well as the signaling probes. Okay. So, in a nutshell these are some of the uh, DNA hybridization arrays which are as on date available commercially um, in, in the market. Uh, so, I have been probably able to kind of take you through at least some of the few uh, integrated gene chip uh, arrangements that uh, are commercially available. Now, let us look into uh, a kind of uh, totally different aspect of uh, how to sequence uh, a DNA and uh, this reaction is also uh, popularly known as uh, the Sanger's reaction uh, developed by um, a scientist called William Sanger in 1975 for which we subsequently won the Nobel Prize. It is one of the first steps in identifying uh, the sequence of information that is there uh, on a DNA molecule and this is also very foundational for uh, the field of uh, molecular biology uh, or diagnostics uh, to have developed. It kind of emerged from this sequencing activity. So, let us look at how the this reaction has been designed uh, in, in a step by step manner. So, to do this thing first what we need to ascertain or find out is what all are the constituents of uh, this reaction. So, uh, let us say we are trying to sequence this particular DNA product uh, which is from 5 prime to 3 prime it is a single stranded DNA structure and uh, let us say you want to find out what follows what in terms of these molecules. Okay. So, as you are seeing here this molecules A, A, T, C, T, G, 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 C and so on so forth is the sequence of information that is really not visible at the outset when you have this uh, DNA molecule with you. You want to find out uh, what is there in the sequence uh, looking at uh, uh, this molecule as a whole. So, uh, this, this reaction is also popularly known as the dideoxy chain termination reaction. Okay. Dideoxy chain termination reaction used for gene sequencing. So, let us suppose uh, as we were talking before we want to detect the sequence on uh, this particular molecule the single stranded DNA molecule which uh, you are seeing here uh, from 5 prime to 3 prime. Uh, so, you need the following uh, for uh, detection uh, you need a DNA polymerase uh, you now already know how the DNA polymerase works it is an enzyme which kind of zips uh, the DNA open and then tries to suture uh, the two daughter strands to make complete strands uh, by fixing oligonucleotides from the solution one by one uh, on the 5 to 3 prime direction and from the th on, on the 3 to 5 prime direction it does so by producing fragments uh, the o Okazaki fragments we, which we discussed in about uh, the last lecture. Okay. So, that is what the DNA polymerase is. So, you need DNA polymerase for this uh, as well. Uh, you need uh, uh, the nucleotides uh, A, T, C and G independently it is called uh, DNTPs. So, you have 4 different DNTPs and then you have uh, uh, a dideoxy chain terminated uh, let us suppose ATP in this particular case. Okay. So, it is a dideoxy chain terminated nucleotide also represented as uh, this here this is the chemical structure of this nucleotide. So, the advantage of the dideoxy chain terminated nucleotide 
in such a reaction is that as and when uh, this particular nucleotide binds to uh, a certain region of the chain the reaction terminates that is why it is called chain terminating nucleotide. So, whenever this dideoxy the dideoxy group essentially prevents the first uh, further the development of suturement of uh, the sugar molecule to the next uh, phosphodiester linkage. Uh, it gives an energy energetically least favor favorable configuration uh, and so therefore, whenever there is a dideoxy group which comes and sets uh, at towards the end of the chain the chain does not replicate anymore it kind of terminates there. So, we use this as an idea uh, for uh, stopping the reaction in a controlled manner as and when we require it to stop. Now, also important uh, to mention here is that this, uh, this, this dideoxy uh, group has uh, some kind of, uh, so it, what is important for me to tell you is that you know particularly for this dideoxy uh, uh, group in, in this particular case, uh, it has a certain concentration with respect to the DNTP. Okay. So, the dideoxy chain or the, or the dideoxy or, uh, nucleotide is uh, of a certain ratio in comparison to the actual uh, DNTPs uh, which are present without the dideoxy group. So, uh, uh, normally in all Sanger's reaction processes uh, the D DDNTPs as, as we popularly know them the dideoxy NTTP is about 1 percent by volume of the DNTPs. This is a standard which is followed in the reaction design. Okay. Now, interestingly when this kind of a reaction proceeds okay, and uh, let us suppose we have a DDATP as in this particular case the DDATP. So, there would be fragments produced from this DNA wherever there is uh, wherever there is a um, a binder molecule T we know that uh, uh, the thymine binds to the adenine okay, from earlier uh, knowledge about the DNA. So, whenever there is a thymine molecule somewhere placed in the chain um, uh, the adenine molecule I am sorry somewhere placed in the chain uh, th that may be a point of cleavage uh, or, or cleaving the molecule as and when the dideoxy group binds uh, with the thymine on it on the particular A. So, suppose there are 50 centers uh, with uh, the nucleotide A on the parent strand of the DNA molecule and this dideoxy uh, chain terminating thymine group which is present as 1 percent of the, uh, the normal DNTPs okay, that kind of binds whenever it binds to any of those 50 sites for A it terminates the chain. So, the the end result of this process or this reaction is a set of fragments of uh, uh, of chains which are terminated each at uh, the adenine. Okay. So, it kind of gives a location to us of the adenine uh, on the particular base pair on, on the particular uh, parent strand of the DNA molecule. Uh, now, let us suppose uh, we have four different such reactions with D, uh, dideoxy ATP, dideoxy uh, TTP, dideoxy CTP and dideoxy GTP uh, each of them are 1 percent of the, uh, the normal DNTPs in the reaction and these four reactions are all independent okay, in four different vials. So, what is going to happen is that wherever there is the presence of a G molecule uh, would be terminated and fragments would be developed in the reaction vessel which contains the dideoxy G molecule. Okay. Similarly, when there is a, a fragment present of uh, let us say the, the adenine the, or sorry the, when there is when there is an end group or, or a, a group that we are trying to decipher is uh, guanine. In that case we can produce the fragments of wherever the guanine was present in the parental uh, chain by putting it with 1 percent uh, D C T P uh, or uh, dideoxy uh, you know C T P uh, cytosine uh, nucleotide. So, uh, if we take all these four products and run it on a gel okay, something like this. 
So, what happens is that wherever there is a chain termination on the ATP would develop based on sizes these fragments which we can later on blow up by using fluorescence. For the DTTP case uh, there can be fragments in this manner and similarly for the CTP and GTP and if we do an overall readout we will be able to get the position of what follows what in this particular chain. So, I am going to kind of uh, take this ahead a little bit later uh, we have uh, almost come towards the end of this uh, particular lecture. So, in the next lecture we will talk about the Sanger's process a little bit more in details and try to see how micro scale architecture can be uh, kind of synergistically developed with respect to Sanger's reaction to do rapid sequencing. Thank you.